You guys remember a few years back when that show True Blood came out on HBO? Uh, I'll never forget this argument I was hearing between some friends. And uh, <laughs> one of them said, hey, I'm going to try to sell True Blood to you. It's like Twilight except for adults. And another friend was like, well, have you guys ever heard of the Vampire Chronicles? It's like Twilight except good. <laughs> and I'll be damned if that wasn't the most accurate description ever. So I've had people tell me, guys, what is so great about the Vampire Chronicles? And I say, well, drink from me and live forever. Do you know what it means to be loved by death? Do you know what it means to have death know your name? You are the night and the night alone understands you and enfolds you in its arms. You are one with the shadows, without nightmare. It's an inexplicable peace. The world changes and we do not. Therein lies the irony that kills us. It was my last sunrise that morning. I remember it completely, yet I do not think I remember any other sunrise before it. I watched its whole magnificent for the last time as if it was the first. And then I said my farewell to sunlight and set out to become what I became. It was as if this night were only one of thousands of nights. A world without end. Night curving into night to make a great arching line of which I couldn't see the end. A night in which I roamed alone under cold, mindless stars. I was a newborn vampire, weeping at the beauty of the night. Because no one could in any guise convince me of what I myself knew to be true. I was damned in my own mind and soul. For what can the damned really have to say to the damned? Hey, what's up, bookworms and bloodsuckers? Mike back today to talk a little Anne Rice and the Vampire Chronicles, and more specifically, 1976's Interview with the Vampire, the book that launched Anne Rice into stardom and the Vampire Chronicles into everyday pop culture, because I think even if you haven't read these books, you've heard of Lestat, haven't you? So uh, guys, this is a series I have had many, many discussions about. Uh, I did a Why You Should Read back at Fright Fest, and I thought it had moderate interest enough for me to keep talking about the series and why I love it, specifically the very first book that I ever read by Anne Rice, that of course is Interview with the Vampire, her freshman effort, and I read it my freshman year in high school. I've told that story many times in my Stephen King videos about how Stephen King, Michael Crichton, and Anne Rice became like my holy trinity in high school because I had the best high school library ever, and I was a new uh, student in the Houston area, knew zero people my freshman year, so I just kind of buried my nose in books at the library, and Interview with a Vampire was one of those during that time. As for the series itself, she didn't really write a sequel for a long time. This was 76. I don't think Vampire the Stat came out until 85. And then she closed it off with Queen of the Damned in 1988. And uh, if you go through and read it now, it very much seems like it was meant to be uh, either a standalone and then maybe a sequel. And the sequel might have went a little long, so she ended up making a trilogy out of it. That's something that happens quite a lot with fantasy authors. But uh, this one, we're just going to talk about this one today because I do have my gripes with the series as it went on. But this trilogy, and specifically this very first book, has aged incredibly well and is something that I would very much like for you guys to read. So we're going to kind of talk about that now. Let's talk about this first effort here by talking about what is it about, you guys. It is about a young reporter who likes to tell life stories. And he has an interview with a man claiming to be a 200-year-old vampire. He begins to tell his tale by talking of an 18th century Louisiana plantation owner named Louis having suffered a tremendous personal loss who then descends into an alcoholic stupor he is then confronted by lestat a charismatic and powerful vampire who chooses louis to be his fledgling the two prey on innocence and give their dark gift to a young girl and seek out others of their kind in paris but louis is struggling to accept the lessons from his teacher and still struggles with the humanity that he has managed to cling on to and over the span of two centuries he will learn many more lessons than what Lestat can teach him, and all will not go 
as planned. And guys, that is putting it very, very vaguely because there's a lot more that happens in this book. And it all starts with Louis and Lestat. Now, I got to begin this by talking about what makes it good or bad. But the good, obviously, I've said it before, guys. This is back when vampire stories still had fangs. They were still considered creatures to be feared. They were not creatures to be lusted after. They were not creatures to be admired. They were not creatures to be hijacked by the YA genre. This was when vampires were scary. Were they sexy? Absolutely. Are they falling in love with 15 year old girls? Absolutely not. Those girls were lunch, okay? And I don't think Anne Rice had any problem, especially here early. She might have softened up over the years, but back then, man, she was vicious, son. And her vampires were every bit as vicious as her pen was. So that is obviously the biggest thing here for me. These characters. The moment of terror that you get in these books, because these characters are so threatening, is every bit on par with Bram Stoker's Dracula, what I consider to be the holy grail of vampire books. I think most would. Just about every vampire story that's come out since then has used that as their roadmap. And this is no different. It takes lots of themes and ideas from Bram Stoker, and it just kind of brought him into a new era of readers. And it was time. It really was. And again, I feel like this was the last hurrah for the, uh, the, the traditional vampire tale before, like I said, things started to really turn around there in the late 80s and early 90s and a big part of that i'm going to blame on Anne rice by the way if you watch my why you should read the vampire chronicles i i, I talk about that Anne rice is every bit as responsible for that movement as all those ya paranormal teen romance authors have been another book that i like to compare this to is salem's lot by stephen king now interview with the vampire salem's lot and Dracula by Bram Stoker. That is my three favorite vampire books of all time. And I feel like they all have the their parts that differentiate them from one another, but they all have those parts that make them kind of make out that trinity of vampire books for me. But let's continue talking about this one here. I don't want to get derailed because I started talking about Salem's Lot and started about Dracula. Uh, I've reviewed both of those on the channel, by the way. You can find both of those. But for me, the biggest thing in this, the two leads. Louis and Lestat, I think it makes such a good way to compare and contrast good versus evil, or what we you know, kind of assume to be the case, because you know, gotta remember that this is a first person story and it is being told from one side. And you know, you do tend to embellish and make yourself look a little better, but we'll get into unreliable narrator here in a minute. Lestat is just probably the worst mentor that a young vampire could have. He knows a lot of things, but either acts like he doesn't or just refuses to tell Louis what some of these things are. And Louis, he is still wallowing in fear and regret of what he has chosen to become. And instead of lusting for blood, he lusts for knowledge. You know, if you think if you're a vampire, you got lots of time to burn. Uh, so uh, I, I think wanting to know more about where they are, where they come from, where are the other vampires at? Things like that are very big questions that Louis explores here. I've heard Louis called a whiner by some people. Hell, I think uh, in the movie, even Lestat even calls Louis a whiner at the end of the movie. Uh, I've heard that. And I can see that point of view. I think it's a beautiful way to, like I said, compare and contrast the difference between a good vampire and a not so good vampire. I'm not going as far as to say good versus evil. Another thing here is the supporting cast is every bit as good. You've got Claudia. Um, a, a young child that they actually uh, make a vampire, and it basically is just the three of them in France is basically a you know a two me and my two dads kind of story that never really gets like ridiculous or anything. It's actually quite touching how much they dote on this small child, you know, until you know so many years go by. She starts to ask questions, and they don't really prepare it on how to handle this. And let's just say, not everything stays a nice fairy tale like it is for you know a few decades together. But uh, and then you got Armand, who is a very intriguing character right from go, and you want to know more about that character. And I'll get into that when I get into the bad, the problems with that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I won't talk. I'm going to keep it talking about this one. I'm not going to talk about books later in the series. I'll just say, uh, waiting for the book, The Vampire Armand. Did not meet expectations, but uh, yeah, I, again, themes in this book, the themes of humanity and Louis' thirst for knowledge over blood is always something that really has stuck with me more than, oh, he's just emo and whining about his station in life. Uh, they, again, to me, it's about discovery, about clinging to his humanity and things like that. I love that she is able to cast vampires as, you know, 
tormented creatures, you know, trying to learn to live with what they are. Whereas Louis more about like, I don't want to take human life and things like that. Uh, you know, he says, even says in the book, you know, I feel when I have to, you know, and, and kind of look at him like a, like a, a Victorian era Dexter. He's gonna, he's gonna kill, he's gonna kill one. I'm gonna kill that, that guy who's like murdering people in the alley and things like that. Ain't nobody gonna miss him, right? But then you get into love and hate in this story. And as much hatred as Louis develops for Lestat, he very much grows to love Claudia, like immediately. And again, that's his beloved, you know, daughter almost to him. So it's, it's, it's very, uh, it, Lestat is very manipulative and he knows he, it's one of those things where you, you worry about these vampires want a companion. They don't want to walk the world alone. So they have to create more and because they don't know if there are any more out there. So, you know, Louis, or sorry, Lestat is always afraid that Louis is going to leave him. And Claudia is always afraid that, that, that Louis is going to leave him and things like that. And it's just it's these things that you always get, to, you wouldn't even think about in any other kind of vampire book about companionship being one of the biggest, biggest themes of the story and it just makes it beautiful but also heartbreaking because uh there are some major major heartbreak in this book and it will tug at your heartstrings a lot and it's not just because oh well this is just a depressing depressing thing no it's it's stuff that really would just cut you to the core especially um well, I don't want to say that. That'll, that'll, that'll just ruin it. If you don't know it by now, if you haven't seen the movie or you haven't read the book, I don't want to say what it is. But uh, yeah, it really it has something that really, really just, just cuts deep. But in turn, it gets us maybe one of the greatest revenge scenes I've ever read in a book outside of The Count of Monte Cristo. It's just so satisfyingly good. And you just... You're at the point of the book where you're like, I want blood, and I don't mean to drink it. I want to see some people dead, and it happens. You know, the body count in this is, you know, you're out. You're out of you're out of bodies here on your fingers that you can count because it's the body count is so high. So, yeah, uh, Rice, like I said, very vicious, and she has no problems, you know, bearing the fangs and, and, and ending some people, and she does has, has no problems letting you know how they're going about that as well. Now, I said that I think that Lestat has like a clear knowledge of a lot of the things that Louis seeks answers on. And I don't know if he is not sure quite how to share these things or if he's just being stubborn about it. But uh, like I said, it does grow into some great hatred from uh, from Louis. But this is a, one of my first cases of ever going through unreliable narrator. And is that what you should really take out of this? Because is Lestat really the monster we're being led to believe? Is Louis just this, you know, uh, just, just happy warrior, you know, just this sad angel? I, it's it's kind of hard to believe, right? So it's something that you don't really think about until you get deeper in the series. And you'll have to read further in the series for me to tell you if that's the case or not. But let's just say there's a reason that Lestat is the most popular character in this series, guys. And it's not for the reasons that you think. You want to think right off the bat, okay, well, Louis is that, you know, that that, that guy you can take home to mom and dad, right? Uh, Lestat is the bad boy. He is the ripped jeans and the leather jacket that all the chicks dig, right? Lestat is the guy that, you know, women want to be with and guys want to be. So it's easy to see why he is the most popular character in this series, even if in this book, you, know, you you kind of feel like he's painted as just this real piece of work. But uh, it, it's also one of those things that you can see why he is so alluring and why Louis took his proposal to become a vampire in the first place. Because the dude knows how to get what he wants. And that leads me to the bad guys. The real bad, not the badass. Um, I feel like Rice was still finding her footing a little bit in her writing. Obviously, this is her debut effort here. Um, I wouldn't say the prose is anything that's like really bad. I think there is some dialogue that is kind of stiff. Uh, there are some things like I read and I was like, yeah, I don't think anybody would say that in real life without some, the other person just like busting out laughing and being like, what are you talking about? But it's, again, it's never anything I feel like will ruin the book for you. It's just things that she got better at over the years. I feel like her storytelling was stronger when she was younger and her writing has been better as she's gotten wiser. Uh, but you know, the storytelling kind of suffered for that. But again, uh, some of the time skips in this, I feel like the stuff that she quickly glazes over as the years are kind of flipping by, she just kind of like mentions that in passing. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I would be more interested in hearing about that than what's going on in the main narrative because there are some parts in the book where we're kind of like, uh, uh, this is okay, but I, I, I kind of liked it when this was happening. Or, you know, she kind of talked about this. I'd like to hear more about that. I'd like to hear more about Armand. I'd like to hear more about 
what Lestat and Louis are doing when they're not together. I want to hear more about those things, but since this is told in a first-person narrative, you don't really get to know what those other characters are doing when they're not around Louis. And then therein lies my problem with the first-person narrative. But uh, again, the way the story is structured, he is telling his life story to someone else, so he's not going to talk about Armand for 400 pages, right? You get that. You get that. I'm just saying that are things that you might struggle with a little bit. And then I'll say there are large portions of this book without Lestat. And I feel like those parts aren't as good. I like Louis every bit as much of a character as I do Lestat in this book. I really, really do. I'm just saying I like it better when they're together. Because when they're together, the book just freaking soars, man. It's just, it's, it's just really, really great when they're together. Especially the three of them with Claudia, too. It's really, really awesome when all three of them are together. But uh, there is a section of the book where it's mostly just Louis and Claudia. And it's good. It's good father-son stuff. And it's a really good uh, character study and things like that. But you're kind of missing Lestat while that's going on. You really, you really, really are. And uh, that would be about it, guys. I think as much as uh, that might bother some people, again, you're going to find so much more that you love about this. That's not really going to be a problem. That leads me to why you should read it. Now, look, guys. Like I said, this is vampire fiction before it got hijacked by the, uh, the the 15 and under crowd, the YA crowd, the paranormal teen romance crowd. And I felt like that's, that was kind of starting to go away, but I feel like it's actually kind of starting to come back again. I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, even, even Rice even fell victim to it. And I can understand why. You know, you got to kind of... It's like you're an old rock band and you're starting to fade into memory. You kind of, kind of adapt or perish, right? So I get why she did what she did. It's just I feel like that's why a lot of fans have kind of fell off by the wayside. But you won't get that here or in this original trilogy at all. It's just straight killer, no filler. It's really good stuff. And, and I think that you're going to be okay with that because you like how her vampires are vicious. They show very little remorse, if any remorse at all. And they actually feel like creatures to be feared. And personally... That's what I want in a vampire book. I want the vampires to be scary. I really, really do. I want people to be scared of them, not in love with them. And uh, again, I think uh, if you're worried about commitment, I don't want to start another series. Here's the deal. If you want to read this as a standalone, I really believe it was written that way. I think the fact that it took so long for her to write a sequel is because this was going to be a one and done story. I don't think she had a series in mind when she started it. And if you like a lot what you read, because I don't say it's a cliffhanger, but it has kind of an ambiguous ending on some things. And I, I feel like if you want to know more, especially if you're very interested in finding out more of the thought, pick up book two, The Vampire Lestat. You can get all those answers. But I feel like at that point, you've got to commit to the trilogy because uh, Vampire Lestat and Queen of the Damned are very much a two-part story. So I would think you would have to do the trilogy, but you're going to want to. If you get that far, you're going to want to. Now, if you want to keep going after that, that's up to you. I feel like this trilogy alone is enough for you to be satisfied with the series. And it's, it really is. It's just going to be three books that you're going to think, that was excellent. I've had enough. I can stop right there and be happy. But again, if you want to read just Interview with a Vampire, I think you'll find plenty to be satisfied with because I really think it was meant to be this way. As for my final thoughts, guys, like I said, top three vampire book of all time for me. I think that this is the quintessential Thing of what I think about when I think about a Victorian era vampire. These are the characters I think about because she just envisioned everything in a way that was just an update on what I loved about Stoker's uh, vampires. And I think the fact that Rice created a character that is known in the pop culture, at, you know, Lestat, I, and I think that he's a character that's that popular for a reason, you know, and it all started here. And the fact that you just get, like, just, you really just get the tip of the iceberg for the depth of this character in this one. And it's one of those things, like, as a reread, you're going to be like, oh, oh, this is so good, because you know what's coming down the road. But again, he's he's a really awesome villain in this book. Uh, or is he? That's the whole question with this. But uh, yeah, there's a reason, like I said, he's been as popular as he has for a while. And I think the book has aged incredibly well. And I think of all, uh, the, uh, I think all audiences are going to like this one. You know, not just horror fans. I know I did this in Fright Fest last year. But uh, some people, I actually think that some people put all vampire stuff in fantasy. I, I mean, I don't. I'll always consider uh, these books are actually listed under Gothic horror. 
I don't know the difference between gothic horror and just horror uh, to me if it's got uh, vampires uh, sucking blood and having no remorse for it and like, you know, walking over your corpse like you were just a piece of, you know, you were just lunch. Uh, to me, that's horror. That's very horrific. So uh, I'm all for that. So guys, I absolutely love this book. It has aged wonderfully and it is why Anne Rice was a staple of my high school years. This book will always have fond, fond memories for me. Uh, introduced me to a very different crowd in high school than I was very used to, uh, to to hanging out with. I mean, you guys remember the 90s. I don't know if you're that old or not, but uh, yeah, goth made like a huge, huge, huge impact in the 90s. And, and, and I felt like that's why these books, even though they were 20 years old at that time, they had started to find a new life with new audience because uh, it, it was... Like I said, it was a The Vampire book before everything kind of went to hell. So, guys, have you read Interview with a Vampire or any Anne Rice at all? Drop in the comments and let me know. I'd love to talk to you about it there.